just want to welcome everybody today. I'm Jay Lickest, Marketing Director here at Benavia, and you're in our Lunchtime Learning Workshop Series. And today's topic, the top 10 priorities in estate planning. And I, I would venture a guess that virtually everybody on here knows Laura Johnson, because she's just a... Uh, she is the top resource, if not in the West Valley, in the entire United States for elder law and planning. So she's going to take over the uh, workshop today for us. We're going to try to get all this information into 30 minutes, and I'll apologize ahead of time for that because there is so much. But just so you know, we are recording uh, this workshop. So everybody on Zoom, um, you will be celebrities. But afterwards, I will go ahead and edit it down. And then within the next day or two, I will have it up on our Benavia um, YouTube channel. And I will send out links to everybody with that. And Laura and Steve, her husband Steve here sent me some more information as well, some brochures and flyers on important subjects. I will have those copied in and uh, emailed to you as well with all of that. So um, you had a chance to look at some of our little housekeeping tips here. If anybody's got any questions during um, the 30 minute workshop here, if you could put them in the chat box, there's a little thought bubble in the lower right hand corner of your screen. And then I will uh, watch those and make sure Laura knows about them. But most of them, I hope we can save till the end because we got a lot to go through. And uh, I'm just going to ask Laura to talk a little bit about yourself, some background and Johnson and Associates. And I will turn this in so everybody could see everybody. And I will stop sharing right now. And then when you're ready, I'll throw the presentation up. So okay. let me close this out. Got everybody in. Yeah. There we go. Perfect. Look at that. Well, welcome. It's um, I'm Laura Johnson, and I, I'm an elder law attorney. I've been practicing for just over 20 years. Um, my husband and I have five children. I'm an Arizona native. And um, we ha I have my own practice that's in the west, the west side of town. So we have a lot of information to cover. Um, I probably won't cover it as thoroughly as some people like. I think most people are interested probably in different things. So um, hopefully when we get to the question and answer, we can, we can more fine tune different areas that you're interested in. Um, so I put this information together. Hopefully it's helpful. Um, the, I just wanted to go through 10 thoughts that I had about, um, you know, what to know uh, for estate planning purposes. So I think one thing that we spend a lot of time doing in my office is giving out resources because people have a hard time finding um, those community resources or nonprofit type resources that are available. Benavia is a, is a stellar organization that provides great resources and we give that information out a lot and there's a list of different resources to go to that are free um, that help a lot of individuals as they age and don't be afraid to reach out to them they're really good at referring out to different um, different organizations and and other subcategories and then I think I think another important part of um, estate planning is just knowing the terminology. So the next part of the presentation just walks through what all the legal documents are. So the health care power of attorney, the mental health care power of attorney, the living will, the durable financial power of attorney, and the last will and the trust. So um, I'm going to run through those really quickly and, and um, then we can clarify any questions that come up. Arizona does have a surrogacy statute. So if someone does not have a health care power of attorney, there's a list of people who would be your health care power of attorney agent. Sometimes that's not the right person or sometimes it's multiple people. So like, for example, um, if it was my children, that would be all five children. And so it would be important for me to say which of my five children should be making those decisions for me. All of them can be involved in the discussion but I don't really want um, I don't really want to fight when it comes to the really important discussion. Uh, Arizona also has a mental health care power of attorney, um, and that covers any type of psych treatment. And we're lucky in Maricopa County to have geriatric psych units, so 
if there was dementia and that um, ends up getting combined with maybe some medication or just a lot of anxiety sometimes as you lose your ability to speak or communicate, that creates a lot of anxiety. And so then someone touches you or is trying to get you to do something you're not comfortable with. So um, there's some outbursts or behaviors. And so then we have to take you in for treatment um, to get you calmed down. And so the one that's closest here is the SAGE unit at the hospital. And so in order to get someone admitted into that, if you have out-of-state documents, because a lot of times I'm asked, you know, will out-of-state documents work in Arizona? And the answer is yes, but sometimes there's extra things we need. So the mental health care power of attorney is really important to have, and that should probably usually match up with the health care power of attorney people. And the Arizona Attorney General's website has a form for that online for free. So if you just Google Arizona Attorney General, website and look up their life care planning packet. You'll find that in there. And if you can't find it, let me know. I'll send it out to you. Um, most, most healthcare powers of attorney have a HIPAA release in them that says these are the people who should be able to get my health information. Um, but it's really important that you um, specifically sign those forms in your doctor's office so that if, if there's a question about if you're capacitated or not, because the healthcare power of attorney doesn't take effect unless you're incapacitated. So sometimes we're in that weird zone where we're trying to figure out if you are incapacitated. So signing those HIPAA documents um, at your doctor's office that you've seen for 10 years is super important because if my son shows up and asks for my doctor to declare me incompetent and he looks at 10 years worth of HIPAA statements from me, and I have never put my son on there, the doctor's going to hesitate to do that. So make sure that those releases match up, especially if you're seen by the VA, because the VA has their own system, their own form. So it's really important to sign their medical releases. And also they have their own powers of attorney. So make sure that those VA medical powers of attorney match your, your personal documents. And then we have our living will and the living will just designates how we want end of life decisions to go. And, mo and so there's two different forms or well, there's actually three. There's a pulse, there's a living will, and there's a DNR. So the, the first step would be the living will, which basically says if I've been diagnosed terminal, if I have a, if I'm in a persistent vegetative state, then I don't want these things. That can be interpreted a lot of different ways. So it's always important to have that discussion with your decision maker about quality of life and what you want and what's important to you so they can they have a measuring stick to work with. Um, then if Arizona doesn't have a statute for the pulse, but it's a pink order that goes into your medical record that says, you know, this person has these conditions. These are the treatments that are okay. These are the treatments that aren't. Um, and, and that goes with you and follows you everywhere that your medical record goes. It's a great discussion to have with your doctor. And the DNR is the fluorescent orange paper that you put your picture on that goes on the wall um, that says, I don't care whatever happens to me, don't start my heart again. That they have to be able to see the original of that. They have to be able to see your picture. The doctor has to have acknowledged that they've had that discussion with you. And it's going to be a split second decision on the part of the first responders. So if you're a true DNR under no circumstances resuscitate you, I think it's always a good idea to work with a hospice because then um, a hospice can be called instead of um, the first responders. So that discussion never has to even happen if that's, if that's what you want. Then we have the financial power of attorney. And most of the time, financial powers of attorney, well, financial powers of attorney can be effective either when you sign them or they can be effective when you become incapacitated. So sometimes people get frustrated and they think that their power of attorney doesn't work for someone, but that's because they have to go get a letter establishing the incapacity and then it will be effective. Uh, and it usually has language in it that says it's durable, which just means I'm doing this now while I'm incapacitated. If I became incapacitated, I still want those same individuals to be my decision makers. 
it's important that the power of attorney outlines everything that you want that person to be able to do, especially because a power of attorney agent isn't supposed to, it's against the law for them to be benefited in any way in using that, that document. So if I'm a spouse and, and it's a second marriage and we're doing like long-term care planning or something, a lot of times that involves moving money from one spouse to the other spouse. So it's important that we have gifting authority in there and those kinds of things so that our hands aren't tied if we get to that point. Um, it does, and, and even if you're married a long time or you have joint accounts, you still need the financial power of attorney for spouses because you, there are always things that um, are only in one person's name, like retirement accounts. So I don't care if we've been married 60 years, if I'm incapacitated, my husband won't be allowed to take money out of my IRA without that power of attorney. So that's super important. I've done, I've had to do, unfortunately, um, lots of court actions for things like that. So super important. Everyone needs a power of attorney regardless. Um, in Arizona, we will honor powers of attorney from other states, financial powers of attorney, but we have we require one witness and one notary. So if you're working with someone who knows that and you're from a state that doesn't require that, they may give you a hard time honoring the financial power of attorney. And you may hear things like, we don't take powers of attorney that are older than this or something like that. Just you have to really be persistent because there's a lot of lawsuits involving people taking advantage of others and um they, they have to honor the power of attorney. So be persistent when you go to use it. Um, a lot of times, so everyone needs a financial power of attorney, a health care power of attorney, mental health care power of attorney. Um, and then to pass assets on to someone else, you can use a will to do that. You can use beneficiary designations can, to do that. You can use joint owners to do that. You can use a trust to do that. So it is important when you put someone on an account to realize that you do, there's two different options. So when someone says, my daughter's on my account with me, um, when someone's on an account with you, they can be a signer or they can just be a um, joint owner. So if they're a joint owner, they own it with you. And if they get sued, they get divorced, those kinds of things, um, then it's involved. That's, that is their account. That's part of that but that, that joint ownership survives my death. So if my son's a joint owner on the account with me, when I pass away, he gets that account. If he's a signer on the account, that's just like a power of attorney. Powers of attorney stop when the person passes away. So um, if, if I pass away, he can no longer sign on the account. So if, if I have him on there for asset protection purposes, I always want to put a beneficiary on the account too so that it's easy to pass to him. Or sometimes I'll have a trust as a beneficiary or something like that. And since we hire a lot of times marketing individuals or people who um, are more in a, they're, they're trying to push product more it's important to ask those questions when you put someone on your account. You know, what's going to happen when I pass away? Will this person have access to it? Will they not? And so just so you know how to do it. If you put a joint tenant on your property with you, sometimes um, people will get nervous and they'll throw their child on their deed with them or something like that. That gives them rights to the property. And so if you want to sell it and they don't want to sell it, you know, it's really difficult to sell half a house. So you're not, so you're going to have your hands tied. So just be careful. Arizona does have beneficiary deeds um, and that's fabulous. So if your main asset is your house and you just want to make sure it goes to your daughter, you can fill out a beneficiary deed and record that. And she just records your death certificate. She will own it um, after you pass away. It doesn't tie your hands in any way. You can refinance it. You can do refinance reverse mortgage on it, you can sell it. But if you own it and when you pass away, it's an easy way to transfer it to someone. You just have to be careful if it's, um, I just had a situation where we had uh, 11 siblings mm -hmm. and the person did a beneficiary deed with 11 siblings. So when the dad passed away, you know, each of the 11 wanted to do different things with the property. So then we were gonna have to go to court 
any way to kind of settle the argument if we're going to rent it or sell it or buy people out or those kinds of things. Um, we also, so a will is the document that you fill out that says what you want, um, what you want to happen with your money at the end of the day. A will only takes precedence if you have no joint owners and no beneficiaries. So it's if I say my daughter is my beneficiary in my bank account, and then in my will, I say my son should get my bank account. My daughter will get my bank account. So the will is a situation of last resort. And so sometimes when people call and they ask us, what do I do? We, um, we say, well, it's going to take a little bit of time when someone passes away to figure out, are there beneficiaries on something? Do we need to open up a probate? Is everything in the trust? All of those types of things. If the assets that are that don't have beneficiary designations on them are under 75,000, then we can do an affidavit and it's a fairly simple process, a probate process to get those out. Um, but, we, but we need to be careful and we always wanna use a trust if we have any special types of beneficiaries. So if we have, um, if we have younger beneficiaries, if we have beneficiaries who have um, substance abuse, issues if we want to make sure like if I want to make sure that two of my children have no information about my estate so I want to keep it very private um, if I want to make sure that um, maybe my boyfriend can live in my house for my lifetime but then but then I want to make sure that the that the house go the house money goes to my kids so those types of things we have to use a trust to handle anything, anything creative or out of the box we need to use a trust for. Um, the important part of the trust is just making sure that everything's in it. So the trust is like creating a business, but the business can't control things that aren't part of it. So I can say in the trust, I want my house to go to my grandkids, but if my house isn't in the trust, it, it doesn't go to my grandkids. So it's really important that the house is part of the trust, that the that the bank accounts come through the trust, that the, you know, that everything's tied to the trust in some way, either through beneficiary designations or retitling or those types of things. Um, let's see. And it's important to remember that title control. So if I do a trust and I don't, um, and at the end of the trust, a lot of times you'll see a list of someone's assets. It says, you know, we have a house at this address. We have a timeshare. We have a bank account. Putting those things on the list shows your intent to put it in the trust, but it doesn't actually put it in the trust. You still have to go through the work to fill out the beneficiary forms and make sure that the title's in the trust and do all of those formalities. So if, if you pass and, and the and the house is not in the trust, regardless of you having the trust, we still have to do a probate to get it in there. If you pass and the bank accounts don't have beneficiaries of the trust, um, then, then they're not going to, then it's we're gonna have to probate it to handle it. So probate is the process of making sure that we can transfer title. So if, if I pass away and I have a house in Laura Johnson's name, and my son shows up and he says, I can sell this house. Um, nobody can guarantee that that's true. So he has to take my will to the court. They give him official paperwork and that gives him legal authority to sell my house, make sure that the beneficiaries who are beneficiaries um, receive that money at the end of the day. So if I have a will or don't have a will, if there are things in my name that don't have beneficiary designations, don't have joint owners, they're not in a trust, that's probate. So probate is the legal process to get legal title to things that don't have a way to transfer. If I put a beneficiary on it or change title at the bank, like I change it with Chase Bank, that's a direct contract with them and that always takes precedence. So, so titling always controls and that's important um, because it's very rarely that I talk to people and I say, who are the beneficiaries on your IRA? I don't know who, you know, is your house in the trust? I think so, you know, so it's, it's really important to, you know, check that and make sure it's not unusual for institutions to lose beneficiary designations, um, especially if, 
if they've taken been taken over by a different company. So it doesn't ever hurt and it, it's never silly to double check that. Um, we just had a we just had a seminar yesterday um, as attorneys for a case that took um, two and a half years to authorize if someone could be cremated or buried and the person's body was held in cold storage for two and a half years while the family fought over this. So um, it's no joke. So if you have preferences about your burial, your cremation, those types of things, prepay for it, um, make your wishes known, write it down, document it, and, and put it all out there so that um, there's good information that we can pass on. It was really interesting listening to the judge because she took information from the mom who was talking about what her son had told her when he was six. She took information from the dad who told her what the son said when he was 18. And then she took information from the girlfriend who has no decision-making authority under the law about you know, recent discussion. And, and the arguing went on with lots of money involved and lots of pain, I'm sure, for two and a half years while the poor, the poor person was you know, kept in cold storage. So um, make your wishes known and, and prepay for it and or set that up and just make it really clear what you want. I have a lot of people call me and say, so my, my partner has dementia or, you know, these things have happened. Do I have to go to court and have them declared incompetent or how does that happen to make this transition? Uh, so the reason we're doing these documents is to stay out of court. The court process is what's put in place if we have no other options. So the way that we have someone declared incompetent so that we can take over under the power of attorney is just getting those doctor's letters. And every time we go to do something for them, we present the document with the, the letter from the doctor that says, you know, this person probably shouldn't be handling their finances or this person shouldn't be making their own personal decision. Most of the time in practicality, how that happens is I'm sitting across from the doctor and the doctor says, you know, this is your diagnosis, you should do this. And, and either they're really uncomfortable with my answer or they feel like I'm not processing it. So they're worried about, um, they need to relay it to someone else. So then they will choose to work with my power of attorney agent so that they can get a good decision made for me. Um, and it's the same with financial. So once you get those those letters from the doctor, that affects those things and you can take over for that person and so that someone doesn't take advantage of them. If we don't have any of this paperwork or if we're having a fight with the doctors about if you're capacitated or not, um, when we go to court to line all that up, which is again, our situation of last resort, um, we're going to do a guardianship for that person to make their to put someone in place to do their personal decisions, and we're going to do a conservatorship to be able to make their financial decision. And this is even if you're the spouse. So if my husband and I are married for um, 35 years and he needs to get money on my IRA, but I can't authorize that, he's going to court to get a conservatorship for me. He doesn't have a power of attorney to do that. Okay, the third thing I wanted to talk about is I have a lot of clients that feel like they have to name the oldest child child or they have to name the spouse as their decision maker, um, but you don't. It's who you choose as your decision maker is super, super important. And if your stomach hurts when you're thinking about it, you should not choose that person. So, um, if you if you tell the person who's your health care power of attorney, you know, this is what I want, and they say, I don't know if I can do that, think about having someone else do it. Or if you see how someone else reacts, like how your kids handle a different situation in their in their in-law side of their family and you don't like it, they should not be your decision maker in that situation for you. And and so Take that seriously. You don't have to name a specific person. You have no obligation. This is not the time to be politically correct because we need the person who's going to step in and advocate for you and do the right thing. And if you can't make a decision between children, so like if I have a second marriage and I want my 
you know, one child from my side and one child from my husband's side to make the decisions together and they don't even know each other because everything is processed electronically now, they're, they have to be able to act independently regardless of what I put in the document. So now we have someone in Oregon who can go and make choices and someone in California who can go make choices who've never met each other. And that's not gonna usually work very well. We're gonna usually end up in court. And the whole idea is to stay out of court if we can. So choose a good decision maker and, and let everything move forward and, and make sure that you feel comfortable with that. And, and if you don't have family members that you can trust, consider using a private licensed fiduciary. It's a good option um, for a lot of people if you find the right person. The fourth thing I wanted to bring up was just make sure that your documents are accessible. We need originals sometimes to go to court or to record if we have property, things like that. So if you put them in the safety deposit box and no one has access to the safety deposit box, that's a problem. Um, and a lot, of, and most of the time, financial documents are not an emergency, but sometimes uh, healthcare documents are. So there's a free storage through the Secretary of State's office that you can use. Um, the website's right there. It's fabulous. They're building a platform that should be accessible by first responders, so they should be able to search my name um, at some point and be able to just look up my paperwork. Passwords are super important. If you have an Apple phone, um, Apple has just put in their new operating system, a way to set up a legacy contact, having had to go to court to get people's stuff off their phone many times. It's a wonderful thing, super easy. You just go into your setting and, you're, and you just choose your legacy contact and it sends them an email. So do that and that will make it Super easy for your family to get your passwords, your pictures, all of those types of things. And leaving some information about you, especially if you're a caregiver, about the person that you're caring for. So that someone has all of that information about, you know, don't play the Beatles for them because it'll only agitate them or, you know, put them in the sunshine and don't feed them pizza or, you know, different things like that. Even for, for me, if something happened to me, my spouse might not know what bills up to pay every month. So those kinds of things are super important to put together in case there's an emergency. Um, the fifth thing I wanted to bring up was just talking to people about what you want because we all keep those things in our head and sometimes we don't say them out loud. And when we do that, then everybody brings their own idea to the table and there's not really, it's hard to have a meeting of the minds and there's a lot of fighting. It's not productive. So as you see your friends go through stuff, as you um, hear about things, say that to your decision makers. I like this. I hated this. That was really horrible of them so that they have a good measuring stick. They kind of know where, where your thoughts are on that. If you want to be very specific about end of life wishes, this five wishes document is a fabulous um, document. Um, you can order it. I think it's $5 online. And that's their website. Um, there, I, I just spent two hours last week on the phone with one of my clients, um, with some guy in Georgia who wanted to buy their timeshare that they've been trying to unload forever for $400,000. And to bring me into the mix, he wanted to me to have a commission. Um, you know, he was going to pay me a commission to um, help him buy that timeshare from them. And there was this contract that didn't make any sense, but it wasn't a contract. It was a pre-contract. I mean, if it feels too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. There are so many people that spend so much time scamming people um, and, and it it's so hard to figure it out. So at, at a certain point, your goal is to maintain liquidity. You're not, there's no magic bullet to make, you know, X amount of dollars or create more income for you. Keep it safe. Don't fall for scams. If you fall for scams, don't be embarrassed about it. You know, tell someone, get some help. Um, the attorney general's office has a great program. I help people with things like that all the time. But keep keep your money as liquid as possible so that if you need it, we or if we need to restructure it in some way, we can do that. 
um, and that it'll be there at the end of the day. Because if I if I put it in the stock market this year, um, and, or if I have it in cash and people say, well, you're losing money because of the inflation rate, but I'm not at the end of the day, I know that I'm gonna have X amount of dollars available and that will help me for the long term. Um, so just, just a little thought on that. Um, don't be afraid to explore VA benefits, um, Medicaid benefits, respite. If your friends say, hey, can we help you, you know, consider doing that. And there's some information in here about all techs and VA. If you have any questions and you'd like to explore that specifically, I'd be happy to. It's very, it's it's very specific to what your assets are, what your care plan is. Um, what your background is, all of those types of things. Um, my eighth thing I just wanted to talk about was simplifying your finances. Your family will love you if they don't have to deal with eight different banks. So, you know, consolidate things, um, put a statement together so they know what your assets are, set up your auto pay as much as you can, um, organize things for them. And if you feel comfortable, involve, you know, your successor in doing all of that. The ninth thing that I wanted to bring up is just having less guilt when you're the caregiver. I, I do a support group for the Alzheimer's Association. Benavia has some great support groups. There are some amazing people who do a lot for their loved ones. Um, and if you show up at the end of the day, then pat yourself on the back because there are people that don't show up and you're awesome. And if you get frustrated, you you still show up every day, that's okay. And if you get angry once in a while, that's okay too. So um, give yourself, because too many times caregiver passes away before the person that they're taking care of and it's because it's so stressful. So. Do what you need to do to take care of yourself. And if I can help, you know where to find me. Um, and the last one I just wanted to bring up is a lot of times people don't understand what the resources are that are available. So I put the website on here for geriatric care managers. So if you needed a social worker that was just your social worker who can help you navigate this situation, like your kids keep telling you to move out and they're in Minnesota and you don't want to go to Minnesota. And, and you just need some ideas. The geriatric care managers are fabulous with helping just being your personal assistant to navigate different situations as you age. Licensed fiduciaries are licensed through the Arizona Supreme Court. Obviously there's some that are good, some that are not so good, but it's a great option because it's not dependent on your net worth and they're not invested in your in your matter because they're making money off of your finances. They're, they're getting paid an hourly wage to advocate for you and follow through with your wishes. So the sooner you get involved with someone like that, if that's what you're gonna do, the better because they know you better and, and they can carry that through for you. And then elder law attorneys, um, that's their, their that organization's website. And that group of individ individuals do a lot of estate planning, but with and I told the future how you're going to pay for stuff, how that's going to work out. So, okay. Yay. Wow. So that was like a whirlwind. But I did it. Yes. <laughs> that's amazing. Very well. Kind of. <laughs> we, we do have a couple of questions. Okay, good question. In our chat box. Good. First one says, what rights does a spouse of a dementia loved one have to make financial decisions if there's no power of attorney in place? Uh, none. <laughs> so, um, so, but the thing is, when someone has dementia, that doesn't make them incapacitated. So even if they're diagnosed, you can still oftentimes do powers of attorney until you get into the later stages of dementia. The tricky part with that, though, is if you have a family that's highly contentious or it's a second marriage or something like that, sometimes you you can get a lot of pushback when you do that. So it's not ideal, but it totally works and it's better than going to court if we can. So if I can sit down with that person who has dementia and I can say, you know, who do you, I, I usually take an assessment of the 
family and the family dynamics. So I know who's going to sue me on the back end. And I, and I say, um, you know, do you know who is this person with you? Do you have any children? So they have to have an idea about their family. Um, and I, and they have to be able to understand the concept of if you sign this document, so-and-so can make financial decisions for you. Is that okay? Is that the person you want? And so it's a pretty low threshold, but having the diagnosis always raises some red flags for people to contest. So it, it depends on what that looks like. Um, so the question about the five wishes. It, so the five wishes is a, it has a healthcare power of attorney in it. It's a fabulous document that is create was created a while ago by a bunch of hospice physicians because they they kept having these documents that said, um, I don't want you to keep me alive artificially, but they but that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So they all got together and they wrote this book and and they it, it's a little booklet. And they wanted to outline the, the different decisions that they wish people would specifically outline. Some of it's obvious, like, please don't fight in my hospital room, that's bad. But it, it actually, even though that seems silly, it's very helpful because if they're fighting in the hospital room, you know, I can shove that in their face and say, look, it's really important that this is a, this is a good peaceful place. And it, it is helpful. I mean, my dad just passed away a couple months ago and two doors down from where he was in the ICU, there was a family that they had security guards out with the family 24 hours a day, bringing some people in, bringing some people out. And that's not uncommon. So, and everybody has, a, has an idea of what you want and there's always guilt. So the, pe the kids who are there with you as you age, usually know what you want and they're more comfortable with the process. The ones that haven't showed up in the last 10 years feel bad. So they just want to give it some more time because they weren't ready. And so they're in your, you know, in the decision makers face, like, why would you do this? You're so, this is so bad. And then they second guess themselves. So the five wishes is a great document that just goes through all of the things that these hospice doctors have been able to think about. And, and you can outline, you know, all these different things. It, it covers five different areas. I have some in my office. So if, if you don't want to pay the $5 or you're not able to pay the $5, let me know and I will send you one. Okay. okay. One more question, I think. Okay. Um, please explain what it means to probate a will. Uh-huh. So did okay. we, did I cover that? I think I did. I think I saw that one. Mary asked that. Mary, did it sound like you got your answer there? Yes, I did. Thank you. Okay. Fantastic. Great. All right. Um, so so then just I just wanted to, if no one has any, does anyone have any questions they want to ask? Or yes. I'm just gonna throw in a couple things. Yeah. 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 Um, From the room. In my uh, trust, I have that uh dementia is incapacitated. Okay. Let's see, and that's what I understand. Di what do you what do you consider to be incapacitated? Because I mean, if you have dementia, you're not really a person anymore. You can't make decisions. But so so dementia is a symptom, and that means that as time as in my in the course of my day, there are periods where I'm not oriented. So there are also periods when I am oriented and there's stages like different things cause dementia. The most common one is Alzheimer's, but it's not always Alzheimer's. So in a, in a normal Alzheimer's situation from diagnosis to someone passing away, unless they have other health issues, you usually have a 10 to 12 year lifespan. In the beginning of that process, um, I'm pretty active. And, and I also, it's not unusual to have a lot of anxiety. It's not unusual to have a lot of, because I'm aware. I, I know that I put something down and I can't find it. I know that I, you know, you know that those things are going on until you reach the other side of that and you don't have that presence of mind. 
um, it, there can be a lot of emotional things that go with it. But then it's, it's difficult to make that decision then. For sure. So it that, I think it's better to put that in, insert that in the trust. So it's a, when you, so it's a legal decision and it's a legal medical decision. And if we're arguing about it in court, it's always going to be a physician who does a neuropsych exam who makes that decision. Um, that's why it's nice if if I have, I mean, it's hard nowadays because you have different doctors, but if if I have a consistent doctor who's watched me, they can write that letter for my spouse and it says, I'm, I shouldn't be making my own decisions. It, most powers of attorney say once a med, once two medical professionals have made that decision or one medical profession. If I'm diagnosed with dementia, I'm not, I still have capacity legally. I can, I'm most, you know how many people with dementia are driving in Sun City? Well, probably a lot. There's a lot of people that drive that shouldn't be driving. Mm -hmm. um, and, but see, that's very vague when you say, okay, I have the capacity to make some decisions I'm fine during the day, sometimes and all. So, you know, that's not a fast rule. The law so, says, the law says, that I have capacity to do legal documents and to make my own legal decisions. If I can have a conversation with you and I can say, that's my husband, I have five kids, these are their names. I understand what a power of attorney does and I want to sign one and I want him to be my agent. So okay. in the moment, that's a pretty low threshold. Yeah, but dementia develops gradually. Correct. Okay, so where do you come to the point where you say, Okay, yesterday he was normal <laughs> and he seemed he was capable of you know cognitive thinking, but today he's not. I totally understand what you're saying. And it's That's mostly, why I inserted that in my chat. It's mostly this morning. Um I'm capacitated and at night when I have sundown news, I'm not. And so that happens in the same day. Yes. So when I'm working sometimes with someone who needs to do a power of attorney who doesn't have one, I'm going to meet with them in the morning because I'm going to say, I met with them in the morning. They understood what I was talking about because that night they might not. So I, but I don't have to be incapacitated for my partner to take over for me. Like my husband has a power of attorney for me now. I don't have, it doesn't have to shut down my right to make decisions. And the law says that even if I'm someone's decision maker, I still have to let them be as independent as possible as long as they're safe. So you're right, that's ugly and it's messy and as is dementia. But we, but um, the law says that someone who's diagnosed is not incapacitated and they still have rights. And so we have to be really careful how we catch that where it becomes very difficult and super messy is when you have frontal temporal dementia, which is someone who they look fine, they act fine, they remember everything fine, but they lose just their executive function. So they don't understand that, they don't understand consequences. So if you talk to a person who has frontal temporal dementia, you wouldn't know unless you were their spouse and you're watching what's going on at home. They're trying to win the lottery. They're hiring a prostitute. They're, they just went back to doing drugs like they did in high school. They just, they just don't. They, they can function, keep a job, but these other things are happening. That's, that's a litigation nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, so and, and the different doctors don't even understand it. So you're right. It's super ugly. And it's messy and it's hard and it's not black and white. That's why we end up in court with it all the time. That's why I put it in the trust. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand that. And that, that's a good point. If you have certain experiences, that's why you have your document. Your document says this is incapacity for purposes of this document. And I talk to my clients about that. And I say, this is what I think we should do in your situation. And they say yes or no, if we want to make it easier or harder for them. Absolutely. It's a, it's a really important point. Mm -hmm. We have more requests for the five wishes booklet. Oh yeah, just yeah. if you call, call, well, you can give Steve the information or Jay. Mm -hmm. 
just call me or I've got your names down now, so I will get those. Perfect. Definitely. All right, folks on Zoom, do not be bashful. This is your time. <laughs> so if you have any questions, you've got one on one with Laura here and our fine folks. There you go. Gail just came on. Yes, I just have a question. Um, my husband has Alzheimer's. He's had an official diagnosis since 2017. He is a veteran. He is service connected. He, what's, his, I'm, what's, his, I am, what's his percentage? A hundred percent. Okay, thank you. He was, I am his beneficiary because he was declared incompetent based on cognitive testing. Okay. Um, so in the next couple of weeks, we will be seeing his primary and his neurologist. Um, we have paperwork. I ha actually have an appointment with you, but not till February, just to go over everything. Okay. But what is what is the letter you re were referring to that the doctor would need to sign if needed? So, so the so if you have paperwork that says. It depends on what the power of attorney says, but most power of attorneys say when this person is incapacitated, and that was the point that was brought up in here, then this is how this power of attorney is triggered. And so you just have to look at the power of attorney. Um, okay. and, and if you need to come in sooner than February, let me know. And we'll figure okay. It out. Okay. Thank you. Because we should probably do that. Okay. Thank you. And. Yeah, and one, one quick thing that I wanted to mention was um, personal property items. Just make sure that you keep your list of personal property items, how that those items are distributed. Those are super important too. And my understanding is you just make a list. My husband and I did start that process and just both of us sign it and date it and then it's official, Correct. right? Okay. Correct. And the reason that works is because Arizona accepts holographic wills and so it's super important that it's in your own handwriting and it's dated and signed so that um, so that it's presentable as a holographic will if there was some kind of discrepancy. Perfect. Okay. But I can't tell you how many times we fight over personal property items that don't even have any value. It's crazy. <laughs> Especially with a uh, marriage with two kids here and two kids right, here. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. But thanks, thanks for being a caregiver because that's amazing. Oh, yes. Well, I try my best. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the kids don't show up to help you be the caregiver. That's oh, no, 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 no. They no. show up for the reading of the trust. So oh, well. yes. But, you know, my <laughs> husband, my husband, I have to get a shout out to uh, Lucy Ann's yeah. because my husband goes there. And They're amazing. Uh, I can't even imagine how they do what they do, but they are wonderful. Absolutely. I agree. And, and gr great gratitude for them. Yeah. I agree. It's an amazing, it's an amazing program. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on Zoom? Oh, I just did such a good job that nobody has any questions. Everybody's That's a professional now. <laughs> That's good. All right. That's so cool. Thank, thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Like I said, we'll be. This was recorded, so it takes a day or two to edit this down on YouTube. But I'll be sending everybody out a link with the uh, with the video itself, so you can watch it again at your convenience. It'll have all of Laura's contact information as well. And like I said, there's three or four additional pieces that I will be attaching as well on some you know finer points of the discussion. So you should have a, a really good arsenal of uh, information going forward. So thank you much, very much for joining us. And don't forget, if you're a caregiver, November 18th, coming up in two and a half weeks, is our Caregiver Connect event, November 18th at First Baptist Church in Sun City West. So we've got some great presentations and interactive activities at that as well, and that's free as well. So it's a great, it's a great program. Yep. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Take care, everyone. Have Thank you. Day. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Enjoy the weather. Yeah. So nice. Those of you that are here, if you